Friends, our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, picking up where this choir's song um, for the first scripture reading left off. This is Ecclesiastes 3, chapter 3, beginning on verse 10. I have observed the task that God has given human beings. God has made everything fitting in its time, but has also placed eternity in their hearts without enabling them to discover what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there's nothing better for them but to enjoy themselves and do what's good while they live. Moreover, this is the gift of God, that all people should eat, drink, and enjoy the results of their hard work. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've always had a bit of a funny relationship with Princeton. Um, While I was there, I struggled very much with imposter syndrome, with uh, feeling like I just didn't quite fit in. I struggled with a lot of things there. And one of the things I honestly struggled with was just how nice Princeton was, how clean Princeton was the type of place where college students can ride around and just drop off their bikes wherever they wanted without any sort of consequence. And so as you walk through Princeton, you will notice bikes everywhere, not just on bike racks, but on lawns and propped up against the sides of coffee shops and bookstores. No need for a bike lock. And something about this bike situation at Princeton while I was there really unsettled me, like the city was just too pristine. Uh, Princeton is in many ways its own little bubble. People who are from Princeton or living there will tell you that. The city of Princeton lies right next to to Trenton, which is a city with integrity, but also with some real issues. And uh, it's definitely the type of city where you would need to lock your bikes. And Princeton, right next door, could not be any more different. And the seminary at Princeton was definitely its own little bubble. It was this church shelter that rarely reflects the outside world. It just doesn't. The seminary was its own little institution where church is perfect, and so is life. It was lovely. And I really do care about the institutional church, but more than that, I care about the way that God interacts with us on the ground, in the real world, in real life, outside of the academy, outside of church buildings, even. And so I was proud to be a student at Princeton, but I was also kind of embarrassed by how nice it all was. And so while I was there, I worked at the Princeton Institute for Youth Ministry, and we were having this big end-of-year potluck dinner at my friend Abigail's house. Abigail was the director of the institute at the time. And we were at her house, we were sitting around this table, and I laid out my whole Princeton philosophy uh, to this pastor who was at the table with me. She had been in ministry for a pretty long time. And uh, the word that I used was sanitized. I said, Princeton is just too sanitized. It doesn't feel real. And this pastor looked at me like I was the stupidest person she had ever seen. And then she switched into that lovely pastor smile. And she spoke from a place of deep ministerial experience. And she said, Greg, you will have plenty of opportunities for life to be difficult or messy. Struggles will find you. Hardships will find you in Princeton or anywhere else. So why don't you just enjoy something good while you've got it? And then I knew why she was looking at me that way. She was right. Friends, sometimes it can be hard to enjoy life. Sometimes because of privilege. Sometimes because of despair. Sometimes because of difficulty or depression or just the overall season of life that we're going through. Sometimes it is hard to enjoy life for no good reason at all. Sometimes we're just stuck in a rut or on autopilot, so accustomed and attuned to our current situation that it is hard to find that perspective, to 
pull back and to view and to give thanks to the immense goodness in our lives. Last week, I preached from Ecclesiastes 3, the first half. Uh, There's a time to live and a time to die. There's a time for crying and a time for laughing, a time for mourning and a time for dancing, that sort of thing. And if you have heard this passage from Ecclesiastes 3 before, you have probably heard it as part of a funeral sermon. The idea being that hardships and death happen, but so does beauty and life, something like that. And this famous passage, there is a season for everything, comes just moments before another of Scripture's most famous verses. And this second verse is so famous, a lot of people don't even realize it comes from Scripture. Ecclesiastes 3, we've just run through the whole gamut of human experience. Birth, death, love, war, crying, laughing, mourning, dancing, and then the cumulative moment, the point of this entire chunk of Scripture, the line so famous, most of us don't even realize it's in the Bible, this hinge verse often gets cut out of the text entirely. We did it last week. Ecclesiastes 3 says that suffering is inevitable. So when you've got a chance, and here it is, the most important phrase, when you've got a chance, eat, drink, and be merry. Eat, drink, and be merry. Hardship is going to find us. So if you've got a chance to dance, then you'd better dance. Death will find us. So if we are alive, or if the people we love are alive, or if even some of the people we love are alive, that is a reason to celebrate. Periods of longing and of lack and of hunger, if not physical hunger, then spiritual hunger, periods of emptiness will find us. So if we are spiritually full or physically full, if God has set a banquet before us in any area of our lives, the least we can do is give thanks. Friends, I once attended a church trip in Southern California Uh, that was equal parts mission work and education. And for the education component, we had this experiential exercise where we would fast for 24 hours just to feel what it was like to go hungry. Again, there's a lot of privilege there in an exercise like that, so let's name that. Um, The fast went well, though. And then day number two came. We were ready to break this fast with a large meal, when the program directors gathered our group together, and then they pulled out their wallets, and they handed each person a single dollar bill. And they said, this dollar is your food for today. And then they broke us up into groups. They sent us out into the city, and they locked the door behind us. Our group leaders were now faced with an ethical dilemma. Do we let our group panhandle? knowing the weird dynamics at play. On the one hand, you'll feed your group, and your group will experience uh, the dependency on strangers, maybe a little bit of awkwardness. Maybe that'll be good for them. On the other hand, you're just tourists, and you're taking a donation that maybe should go to someone who needs it more than you. One group did ask for money. They hit the streets, collected just a couple of dollars, and then they combined those dollars with the eight dollars they were given, one for each member of the group, and they bought a cheap pizza, and then they called it a day. That's one option. Another option, maybe you as a group decide to practice generosity and humility. So maybe you pool your money together, just what you have, and you buy a meal for someone else, and you elect to go hungry. Several groups did that. And then there was this one group. This group did not know what to do. They wanted to eat, but they couldn't in good conscience ask for money from strangers, not when there were others right next to them who really needed the money. And so what they did is they walked into one of the nicer neighborhoods in the area, an area that had seen a lot of recent development, a lot of restaurants, kind of like Atlantic Avenue, Uh, So they went over there, 
And then they would go restaurant to restaurant. And they would explain the situation just to see if there were any leftovers, anything that may be thrown out at the end of the night, something that they could get a hold of as a group. And time and time again, this group was met with a no. I'm sorry. We can't do that. That's against our policy. We'd love to help, but our hands are tied. So it went on like this for a couple of hours. And the group was getting ready to call it a day. They were going to head back to the church along with everyone else. And on their way back, this group decided to try one last place, an upscale Italian restaurant with a name nobody could pronounce. It was valet parking only. Folks were entering the place in nice dresses and fancy suits. The place was so fancy, the group had intentionally just passed it by on the way up. Why bother? So the group leader went into the lobby and explained the situation, and he made a very simple ask. He said something like this. I know you're the type of place that gives bread baskets with every meal. We're on this experiential church trip thing, and we'll be fine either way, but I've got these kids with me. And I'm wondering if we could have a basket or two of bread for them, just so they don't go hungry tonight. They will be fine tomorrow, but is there anything you can do? That was the ask. The host held up a finger and said, wait here. The group had been doing this now for a couple of hours, and so they knew how this would work. The host would disappear, talk to his manager. Then a few minutes later, he would return and say, I am sorry, there is nothing I could do. You can't be helped. That sort of thing. It took the host a long time to return. So long, in fact, that the group leader almost left, but he didn't. He stuck, he stuck around, and then when the host did return, the host did not say yes or no. He simply said, how many? Eight? The host nodded, then he left again. About ten minutes later, the host came back to the front of the restaurant, and he said, come. Follow me. And then he led this group of sweaty teenagers and adults in matching church shirts and flip-flops through the fine dining section of this restaurant into an exclusive wine room right by the kitchen, the type of place that would be reserved only for the fanciest of parties. And the host led the group to a large table with a pressed white tablecloth And on top of that table was a bounty of bread baskets and homemade pasta and fresh salads and juicy steaks and big pitchers of lemonade and water and iced tea. The group leader said, we can't afford this. And he tried to hand the host the $8 that his group had. And the host just pushed the money back into his hand. And he said, Your money is no good here. Bon appetit. The group ate the meal in near silence. They were overcome with emotion. Words just kind of seemed to fail. And then around the table, each person began to weep. Tears of gratitude. Tears of joy. Yet even as they ate this group realized how fortunate they really were. And that word popped up again, privileged. They realized that they were tourists in what for many people, including many of us in this room, is a lifelong struggle. Not some 24-hour or 48-hour experiential learning exercise. And so then they wept for entirely new reasons. New tears mixed with the old. Sorrow and joy, gratitude and sadness side by side. Friends, profound joy often coexists with deep sadness. Joy emerges from sadness, from despair, from desperation. True joy sprouts like a flower through cracked asphalt, like laughter at a funeral 
like a banquet you could never afford. True joy forms like a cast over a broken bone, or like a signature on a cast over a broken bone. Like scripture at a hospital bed, like a parent there to dry your tears, like a rainbow after the storm, like communion before crucifixion, or crucifixion before resurrection. True joy dares to sprout, not in spite of sadness, but alongside it. True joy is defiant. It's rowdy. It's celebratory. It stares death and disease and anger and grief and everything else in the face. It stares that ugly half of the Ecclesiastes 3 list in the face, and it says, we will find a reason for joy. We will eat, we will drink, and we will be merry. True joy comes when we realize that we have all been invited to a great banquet which God has prepared. True joy comes when we accept Jesus' invitation to come not as we are, or to come as we are, not to bring our perfect selves, but to bring our broken selves, our whole selves, our messy, desperate selves hungry selves. True joy comes when we accept Jesus' invitation and when we sit down at the table for a feast that we could never afford. And true joy comes when we break bread and when we give thanks and when together we eat.